Welcome everybody to this morning's webinar, preparing now for next year's COVID-19 public inquiry uh, webinar. Um, it almost sounds like get your Christmas presents now, <laughs> really. We're delighted to see so many of you joining the session today and hope you will find the presentations and discussions to be both useful and informative. We have what can only be described as a galaxy of talent. I am joined firstly by my colleagues, Kareen Patry and Ben Fulbrook. Both Kareen and Ben have been um, counsel to the inquiry. Ben in the recent ICSA hearings, Kareen infamously as the girl on the left. She was one of the junior counsel to the inquiries during the course of the Leveson um, inquiry into press standards. Um, following on from Kareen and Ben are going to be talking about uh, in effect preparing for a public inquiry, hints and tips about um, evidence gathering for those of you who may well be representing parties and just to explain and explore a little bit about the way that a public inquiry works. We shall then be passing on to Chris Jacobs. Chris has represented a, a number of the core participants in 10 strands of the ICSA inquiry and he is also representing a number of core participants in the newly announced Post Office Horizon inquiry. He is going to be talking to you about becoming a core participant. Last, but by no means least, is Alex Goodman. Alex is currently uh, representing a number of core participant immigrants in the Brookhouse inquiry into failures in the de immigration detention system, which is due to start in November. And he in particular is going to be talking to you about the interrelationship between public inquiries and the duties under Article 2 and Article 3 of the Human Rights Act and how that may well inform both the terms of reference um, the scope of that which is covered and the necessity to hold an inquiry in the first place. Just a few housekeeping matters. Microphones are automatically muted so you don't need to adjust your local settings. We do very much welcome questions. You will see a little Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Please do uh, ask any questions you wish. Um, we will endeavour to answer as many of them at the end of our presentations. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. You'll receive a link to the presentation shortly after the conclusion of the event. And if your connection is lost, please just rejoin using the link that you were sent. So without further ado, I pass on, I believe, firstly to um, Karine and to Ben, who are doing a double act about evidence gathering and what to expect from a public inquiry. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Fiona. Um, uh, as Fiona sort of hinted at, it, there's uh, sort of some limits on what we can say about evidence gathering, what to expect from this particular inquiry, because obviously its terms of reference, its composition are unknown, but we can uh, make some guesses and we can provide you with some hints and tips. And I suspect there'll be some organisations listening to this who are who know that they will be uh, part of the inquiry process. There'll be others who hope to be. Um, and there'll be uh, many who, who aren't sure, but um, you know, particularly if you if you if you're very confident, if you're NHS England, for example, you will be involved with it. Um, and there are steps that all 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 all, 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 all potential parties can take to um, improve their readiness when the inquiry uh, is announced. Um, by way of overview, then um, I'm going to speak to you about the inquiry's powers to gather evidence and then a few practical tips for preparing that evidence. So that's gonna be the subject of my of, of what I say. And then Corrine is going to come on and speak about what to expect more generally from the inquiry if you're a, if you're a participant or, or, or witness to the inquiry. Um, so onto the inquiry's powers to gather evidence. A statutory inquiry, um, as you might expect from its name, has a number of statutory powers and they're contained in the Inquiries Act 2005 and the Inquiry Rules 2006. Um, the, the main one, as far as evidence gathering is concerned, is Rule 9 of the Inquiry Rules, which provides that the inquiry must send a written request uh, to any person from whom it intends to take evidence. And that's commonly known as a Rule 9 request, and it usually comes in the form of some kind of letter from the inquiry. I mean, it's important to note that 
the inquiry's ability to ask for evidence is quite wide ranging. It can ask for documents, it can ask for any other thing, um, and it can, it, it can and commonly does ask for, for uh, witness statements. And in fact, typically a Rule 9 request would ask you for a, wit a witness statement. And when it does so, um, what the inquiry has to do is to provide a description of the matters and issues and topics it wants to be covered. So, for example, when the inquiry is, um, when the terms of reference are settled, it might decide it's going to look at particular themes. And within that, it might, it might break those down even further. And, and what will usually happen, I think, is with a, a Rule 9 request, we'll set those out and it might, and one would hope that it would supplement them with perhaps particular questions to you or to your organisation for documents um, or for evidence about particular points. So that's the framework upon which you can then move to draft your witness statement and, and collect um, any sort of uh, linked documents that the inquiry requests. Uh, from you. Now it's important to note as well, once you provided your, your Rule 9 response, um, you'll be given a deadline for doing that. Um, you, the inquiry might then get back in touch with you uh, again to ask you for uh, a sort of follow-up statement or follow-up documents. Um, those responses, those Rule 9 responses are really important and the inquiry will use those usually, as I said, to, to, to sort of drive its evidence gathering to narrow some of the issues down, to identify particular themes it wants to drill down into. And it will also use those to um, determine, to some extent anyway, from whom it wants to hear oral evidence at any live inquiry hearings. So a good statement, uh, well, it, it, a good statement might mean you're more likely to be called to give evidence. It also might mean you're, you're less likely because the inquiry uh, feels like it has everything it needs from you. It's really difficult to say, and it will depend on who you are and on the particular terms. But, but those requests obviously are very important. And I think it's, it's also fair to say that, um, that there, there is scope for informal dialogue between you, most likely, and the inquiry during the Rule 9 process. So there, if there are issues which you think need to be clarified about the Rule 9 request, then it's better to do that sooner rather than later so that you're not hard pressed to meet the inquiry's deadlines. Um, uh, so it's also worth noting that the evidence provided to the inquiry can, dis can be disclosed. So uh, section 18 of the Inquiries Act um, requires the chair of the inquiry to take reasonable steps to secure that members of the public are able to obtain or view a record of the evidence documents given um, or produced to the inquiry. So. Um, you know, that might not mean, reasonable steps might not mean every single thing has to be disclosed, um, but, but reasonable steps have to be taken. So, for example, almost certainly any documents which are referred to in an inquiry hearing will probably be published by the inquiry and documents which are referred to in the inquiry's final report will certainly be published um, by the inquiry. But clearly this, this the publicity element of the, of the inquiry is part of the whole point of it, but it's also a concern for Organize, some organisations who've been asked to give evidence because they obviously would be concerned about disclosing sensitive information um, which relates to those organisations. Um, now, everything I've said, so Rule, rule 9 um, of the inquiry was it's not, it's not a sort of mandatory rule. So the vast majority of evidence provided to the inquiry is provided voluntarily. No doubt that's primarily because all parties have an interest in um, public scrutiny of important decision making and, and perhaps no more so than during this sort of COVID uh, response, but also because there's a bit of a sting in the tail in sections 21 and 35 of the Inquiries Act. Effectively, section 21 um, provides a chair of the power to issue a notice uh, requiring a person to either attend, usually for a hearing, um, or, or produce a document or, or a witness statement. So effectively, if you receive a Rule 9 request and, and don't respond or you refuse to reply, the inquiry may may um, issue a Section 21 notice uh, against you. And what Section 35 does <coughs> is it makes it a, an offence to fail to comply with that Section 21 notice without reasonable excuse. So that's, that's the, one of the reasons, no doubt, why many people decide voluntarily to provide information to the inquiry. The point is, if you don't, um, and if the inquiry thinks it's sufficiently important, 
uh, it may issue a section 21 notice uh, against you sort of effectively forcing you uh, to do so. So one of the questions that you might be asking uh, is can I protect sensitive material? Do I just have to disclose everything? The answer to that is you can protect sensitive material. For example, section 22 of the Inquiries Act um, basically means you, you, an inquiry can't compel a person to produce evidence that, it, that the court that a court in any civil proceedings couldn't compel you to do. So the most obvious example is um, legally privileged material and that can be withheld from disclosure. And also laws on public interest immunity apply as they would in, in civil proceedings. In addition, for some sensitive material, you can seek a restriction notice or order under Section 19 of the Inquiries Act. Um, and, and effectively, that, that is something that the inquiry, um, uh, well, so, sometimes they have to be imposed as a matter of law because the, the law requires certain things not to, not to, be, not to be disclosed. But also um, there's a discretion uh, vested in the chair or the minister. They consider it to be conducive to the inquiry to be necessary in the public interest, um, et cetera, to, 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 to make, a, make a, um, uh, a direction under a restriction notice or order. So you can obviously engage in dialogue with the inquiry over that and you can seek, um, you can seek restriction notice or, notices or orders at, at sort of at any point and, and the chair can rule um, on those. So then to some practical tips for giving evidence, um, you see a series of pictures there, but um, you know, clearly, as I've said, we don't quite know what evidence is going to be required because we don't know um, what the terms of, uh, of reference of this inquiry will be. But a few things that you can you can think about and the, the, the intensity of thought that you give to this will probably depend on who your organisation is. As I said, if you're, for example, NHS England, likely that you're already thinking about these things. Um, but for, for other organisations, it's less clear whether they might be required um, to do so. For example, school or, or education, it, you know, unclear whether the inquiry will cover issues like, like that. But um, so taking each of these three things, the, the, so the first, the, the ship's log, what I mean by that is, is a sort of decision logs. Now, it's quite common, for particularly for, for large public authorities and, and other organisations now to keep um, written logs of decision making, particularly during times of crisis. Um, and if you have got one, then it is worth reviewing that, just making sure it is it is complete. And also um, you, you, that can be a useful starting point for organising and gathering documentary evidence. So, for example, if a decision was taken on a particular day, can you therefore can you find the, the, the paper trail? You know, who authorised the decision? What did they say? What was being said in, in correspondence and emails, etc.? And if you haven't got a decision log, then it's worth trying to put something like that together, because that will probably form a framework from which you can make a put together a witness statement. So identify key individuals who are involved in decision making. What did they do? When did they do it? Why did they do it? Try and put all that together, um, because that will, will help enormously if you do get a Rule 9 request for a witness statement. And then linked to that in the top right then is filing. You, hopefully um, your organisations do have good corporate record keeping um, procedures and sort of all relevant documents will, will be filed and retained. Um, but that is not always, it's not always the case quite just un, you know, for obvious reasons, especially when things are happening very, very quickly. Um, therefore, using your decision log to some extent, do try and identify documents which are relevant, documents which you think are missing, see if you can find those and file them in some kind of logical way that, that means that if you're asked to provide all the documents you have about the discharge of patients to care homes, for example, you, you will be able to find them quite quickly. That will save you a lot of time again when it comes to um, responding to a Rule 9 request. It might also mean you're able to identify potentially privileged or sensitive documents in advance so that you can take steps to try to, to obviously safeguard some of that sensitive material. And the final thing is uh, people. Um, the bottom there, uh, you know, you will need to be speaking to your people, the people who are involved in making these decisions, as I said, to, to fill in some of the blanks that you have, um, to see if you can find documents that are missing, to capture their experiences now, earlier, so you can get obviously a more reliable and complete um, 
picture of, of what, what happened when these key decisions were made. And that applies particularly to any staff who might be leaving the organisation or who have already left. You want to capture their views and their, any evidence that they might give before they leave so that you have a good record of it. Um, it's not particularly good to say to the inquiry, we don't know because the person who is involved with this has left particularly when parties are now on notice that the inquiry is going to be happening. So make sure, for example, if someone's leaving you do an exit interview, um, that everything they have, all the relevant documents they have are properly filed on a corporate sort of record keeping um, framework so that um, you can um, obviously access them when required. So those are some practical tips on evidence gathering. And I'm now going to hand over to Kareen who is going to speak about what to expect from the public inquiry. Good morning. Thank you again for joining us. It is a real pleasure to have so many of you. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about the very massive topic of what to expect from the public inquiry. Now, that could potentially cover a very large number of areas. So what I've done is I've broken it down into five particular areas. Who are the main players and what power do they have? What are the relevant stages of an inquiry? Are the hearings all in public and will they be televised? Representation and funding, which is an enormous topic in itself, but will probably be of interest to many of you. And then the inquiry report, what to expect. So starting with the main um, players, uh, the arguably the most important person that will be appointed is the chairman. And I've said also in brackets and the inquiry panel. Now, we have absolutely no idea at this stage um, whether they're going to appoint a judge, whether they're going to appoint someone else, whether they're going to appoint more than one chairman, which is entirely possible given the scope and breadth of this particular inquiry. We don't know what kind of panel they're going to be looking at, if they're going to have a panel. Um, uh, in speaking to some of the other speakers this morning, it was suggested um, that in one forum that the inquiry panel might need to include a former prime minister. Now, whether or not you could persuade a former prime minister to come along and, and spend a considerable period of time sitting on an inquiry panel, I don't know. But you can see that uh, who is appointed is going to be really important. And it's fair to say that that person uh, drives the inquiry, they, they will drive the timing, they will drive uh, the way the evidence is heard. They, they really are at the absolute centre. And I've tantalisingly said, how do you gain access to that person if you are not, for example, counsel to the inquiry, but you're representing a party? Well, the answer is there's no direct access. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the best way really to have access is through counsel to the inquiry. And I'll come on to, to talk to you briefly about what counsel to the inquiry does. That is definitely your best source of access because counsel to the inquiry as I know from personal experience, has very considerable access um, to the chairman on a daily basis. Um, and if you've got the ear of counsel to the inquiry or you're able to put questions, for example, then your chances of getting that to the chairman are pretty, pretty high. But in terms of everyone else, the main players are the secretary of the, to the inquiry. Never quite figured out what that person does, but it is an important role, usually taken by a civil servant and an important one. Um, and if I tell you that the Secretary to the Inquiry at Leveson is now a High Court judge, um, then that would tell you everything you need to know about how important that position is. Then there'll be at least one solicitor, probably more than one solicitor at Leveson. We had a whole team. They are appointed from GLD generally, um, and they are have an incredibly important role. Then there's counsel to the inquiry. Um, depending on the inquiry, there might be one, one counsel to the inquiry. Unlikely in this case, it's likely that there'll be several. In fact, there might even be several counsel at different stages dealing with different topics. So um, they're obviously important and they um, have the inquisitorial role of ensuring that all the evidence is heard and they usually are involved in writing the report. And then the other important uh, group are representatives of core participants and you'll hear all about core participants when we get to Chris's part of this talk. So secondly the main stages of the inquiry well every again inquiry differs slightly but these are the key stages so first of all the setting up and preparation for the inquiry. Now you'll have heard in the press that um, particularly the Labour Party have criticised the government for not setting up the inquiry sooner. And the reason for that, and I, as I say, I make absolutely no comment on whether it's appropriate to make that criticism, but um, it's true to say that there's a lot of work that needs to be done between the day that the inquiry is set up and the terms of reference 
the terms of reference are agreed and then the day when the oral hearings can actually start. Now you'll have heard from Ben's talk the considerable work that goes into, for example, obtaining evidence in advance. Um, so by way of disclosure or by way of witness statements. So that's a very, very lengthy process. At Leveson, in fact, we were only given the summer to, to do that process, but it wasn't a long time. And I think given the breadth of this particular inquiry, that is likely to take some time. Then there will be oral hearings, and that's the bit where everyone gets really excited because suddenly the TV cameras are on and it's all happening and people are coming along to give evidence. Generally, there are preliminary hearings first where various procedural issues are sorted out. Sometimes there are challenges early on um, and then there are opening statements by the, by the various parties. So counsel to the inquiry and then probably representatives from the various core participant groups. Um, so after the, after the initial hearings, there'll be oral evidence. So witnesses coming along to give evidence. And I have for you a poll because I'm told that this is keep make sure everyone is still awake at this point in the seminar. And what I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to, I'm just going to click on this in a moment. But what I'm going to ask you is at this particular inquiry, this is going to be the COVID-19 inquiry. Who, sh who do you think should give evidence first? Okay. And I'm going to give you the options. And hopefully a screen will pop up on your, well, a separate screen will pop up on your screen. Now, can you see, you can vote, right? These are your options. Who should give evidence first? Should it be someone like a government minister, like Matt Hancock, for example? So someone who can kind of set out what the government did. Should we be looking at, the? should we be hearing from the scientists first? You know, what they were telling the government at the time, back in March, just before Christmas, explaining the science. Should we have victim or survivor groups? So, um, you know, at Levison, for example, we had the victims of press abuses giving evidence first. And then uh, yeah, Dominic, Cum uh, whoever voted for Dominic Cummings, I'm quite impressed. Um, I wonder if he'll come and give evidence. He probably will come and give evidence, won't he? So only 50% of you have voted. If you don't have to vote, this is just for fun. I'm just interested to see. Ah, now you see, I think I agree with you. I think this is where we are. 46% of you think the scientists should give evidence first. It's really interesting. I think I might agree with that because I would have always said survivor groups. You've got to get survivor groups up first so that they feel right from the start that they're being listened to. But actually, I think in this case, I think we might want the scientists to explain what they were saying. Um, so thank you. I'm just going to share the results with you. And then I'm going to, only one person voted for Dominic Cummings. And then I'm going to say stop sharing results. Right. And then I'll come back to the main stages of the inquiry. Um, after there's been all the oral evidence, there'll be a closure. There's a proper formal closing procedure with statements and so on. And then there's a period why, while the uh, report is written and then there's publication of the report. Are the hearings in public? Um, well, it depends on the nature of, of the particular inquiry, but absolutely in this, in this case, I have no doubt that the hearings will be in public and not only that, but they'll be live streamed. And, and the reason for that is really obvious. It enhances public confidence. Um, at Leveson, it was live streamed and then the TV stations could just pick up the live stream whenever they wanted. Um, that has obviously um, significant consequences, which I'll, I'll talk to you about in a moment. But it, I think in this case, I think it would be incredibly unlikely that it would not be uh, dealt with it in that public manner. I mean, everybody in the UK has been affected by COVID in some way. So whether you have had COVID or you still have long COVID, whether you have lost a loved one to COVID, whether you've had your child at home um, because the schools have been closed, whether you've just been you know, unable to go to watch your local football team, everyone has been affected by COVID. So uh, public confidence will be enhanced, I'm sure, by, by holding it in public. So the question then is, well, are there any exceptions? So you may be very nervous about giving evidence um, at a public inquiry, not just at a public inquiry, but when you know it's live streamed and everybody might watch, including your mum. Uh, my mum used to regularly make, message me with how my hair was looking and so on. Um, there are exceptions, but 
you're going to need a really good and legitimate reason. And the reason I say the fake shake there, you know, none of you will remember the fake shake now, but the fake shake was a man who worked for a popular tabloid newspaper and who used to do these investigations by dressing up as a fake shake and then trying to basically see if various celebrities could be corrupted in various ways, whether they could be persuaded to accept bribes or sell drugs or something. And he said, well, I'm happy to come along and give evidence, but I will give away who I am um, if I come and give evidence on television and I'm not prepared to do it. And the chairman accepted, Brian Levison accepted that that was a legitimate reason. So the live stream was switched off and he gave evidence behind the screen. Um, I saw him, but uh, very few people did. So there may be a, a sort of raft of different legitimate reasons why not. But to be honest, a chairman is likely to be pretty strict and you will need a really good reason not to give evidence. And then the last thing I was going to say, which was about consequences, is media training. Right now, this is likely to be probably one of the biggest inquiries there has ever been in the UK. It's, it's going to be wall to wall on the television and in the newspapers for months and months. Um, very famous politicians will come and give evidence. It will be hugely difficult for um, survivor groups, for example. Um, have a think about whether it is appropriate for the person who's going along from your organisation to get media training. Now, I know this, that sounds a bit strange, but from personal experience, I can tell you, Fiona introduced me right at the beginning of this seminar as the woman on the left. And that's because when I um, first appeared at the public hearings as counsel to the inquiry, I sat, when, when, when the inquiry was being shown on a television screen, I sat to the left and famously, Hugh Grant was giving evidence and I was kind of in the left of the screen and my face could be seen. So my reactions could be seen as he gave evidence. And I got home that night and I found I'd been trending on Twitter all day. I'd had tens of thousands of emails, I kid you not. And I had people following me in the street. Journalists turned up at my house. I had, um, I can't even tell you, a deluge. And it is really likely that anyone who, I mean, that's just, that was just me cancelled to the inquiry, but it's very likely that anyone who is giving evidence on a sensitive topic is going to attract media attention. So give some serious thought to, to giving them some media training about how to deal with all this. I think we can now move on to representation and funding. Now, this is an absolutely massive topic and um, I can't possibly cover it all, but just know that in a, obviously inquiries cost a lot of money and there's obviously quite a lot of public criticism that tracks, but inquiries are empowered to grant funding for legal representation where it's appropriate to do so. So your two sections, the two, two relevant um, provisions that you need to look at are section 40 of the Inquiries Act 2005 and then rule 20 of the Inquiry Rules 2006. So it, it's not just about legal representation. You can apply, for example, to have expenses paid or compensation for lost time, so if you've not been able to work because you were attending to give evidence, but also where appropriate legal representation. And the test for obtaining funding from the inquiry, and it's the chairman who will decide ultimately whether or not to, to grant funding for legal representation, is that you must either be attending to give evidence or um, preparing evidence, so you know, you're having to get a document together, or, and I shouldn't say and, it should say or, that you have such a particular interest in the proceedings or the outcome that this justifies an award. And you can make an application at any time. So you can do it right from the start. You can be doing it as soon as the inquiry is announced and it's clear that you're going to be giving evidence. Or you can do it after the money has been spent on your lawyers. I mean, it's dangerous to do it that way because you may not be recompensed, but it's you can do it at any time. And the chairman is the person who makes the decision. They will, so rule 20 tells you all about how to make an application and how, what tests are applied. But effectively, they will look at financial resources. They will look at whether it's in the public interest to grant you funding. And they can attach conditions. So for example, they can say, well, we're going to, yes, we agree that you should attend between January and March. And you're going to be capped at, X pounds an hour and at X number of hours. Um, and, and that's it. You can't, it's 
very hard to challenge whatever decision the chairman makes. You can challenge by way of JR, but frankly, the courts will be very slow to interfere in any such decisions. At Levison, those representing the core participant victims got public funding because it was considered in the public interest that those people be um, funded to attend. But the fact that there had been some private donations was taken into account. But you don't have to be a core participant. So that's the thing that you need to know. And then finally, the inquiry report. Well, that usually takes a while to complete, sometimes years and years and years. It will really depend on exactly how this inquiry is set up. So if different chairmen are dealing with different bits of the inquiry, then that might be quicker. If it's one big report, um, then it will take longer. The things to note about an inquiry report are you will always be warned if it is likely that you, your client, your organisation is going to be criticised in the report. Now, that doesn't mean you can really do very much about it, but there is a requirement. So if you look at um, rules 13, 14 and 15 of the 2006 rules, you will see that anyone who's likely to be the subject of criticism or who has already been the subject of criticism during the course of the inquiry will receive a warning letter. There's no express statutory obligation to do that, but unless you do it, then you won't be criticised in the report. Now, that is intended to give you a chance to, I mean, in most cases, you will know because you'll have read the writing on the wall as the inquiry has gone on. But um, the warning letter sets out in detail the, the criticism that's likely to be made, evidence in support, and will await a reply. So you can reply. Um, so that's quite an important thing to know because it means that unlike, you may have seen some references um, to the Daniel Morgan report, for example, recently, um, and th there were sort of arguments about whether or not that, that report needed to be disclosed. Well, no one's ever going to, to give anyone the draft inquiry report, um, but you will have a chance to be warned if it is likely, and you will know the nature of the criticism you're in for, so you can be prepared um, when the report finally comes out. Although, of course, um, the inquiry may change its mind and decide it's not going to criticise you, um, So, but, but the procedure is there. And then finally, um, standard of proof. It's something that's often asked of me is, well, well, how do they decide on the issues? What, what, what standard do they apply? And the answer is the 2005 Act tells us absolutely nothing about that. But from inquiries that I've studied, um, it, I've seen that it's, it depends on the issue being decided. Now, I think it is very unlikely here that um, this inquiry will be determining criminal liability. I mean, I think it's almost impossible that, we, that they could do that. So I don't think they'll ever be applying a criminal standard. But there are interesting arguments to be had about what standard of proof should be applied. And it's something which you should really keep an eye on if you're representing a party to, to the inquiry. And it will really depend because, of course, the range of subjects um, potentially being covered here is very significant. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see um, on an individual basis, I think, as to what standard of proof is um, imposed in respect of the different issues. I think that's me and thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand over now to Chris, who's going to speak to you about core participants in a little more detail. Hello, I hope you can now see me and hear me uh, correctly. Um, I have a bit of uh, um, technical issues this morning, so if uh, you can't see or hear me, then um, please let me know. So we're going to be talking about um, core participants. Um, and, um, and essentially, uh, the first question is, what is a core participant? Um, there is no definition of a core participant in the Inquiries Act or the Inquiry Rules, but it's generally understood to refer to uh, an individual or an organisation who will play and who does play a key role during the inquiry process. Core participants usually attend uh, for all of the proceedings or for substantial parts of the um, uh, hearings and it may well be the case that this is going to be a modular inquiry because the uh, range of um, the topics for the inquiry to consider will probably be too substantial to um, deal with in one um, hearing. Um, a core participant um, importantly is represented in a statutory inquiry by legal, by legal representatives, that's not the case in a non-statutory inquiry and um, also importantly there's the distinction between a witness um, who is not permitted to ask questions or play an active part 
and a core participant. Um, so um, what is a core participant entitled to do? Um, a core participant um, can um, either themselves um, acting in person or through their legal representatives make opening and closing statements at any hearing. Um, they can ask questions of witnesses at public hearings, the equivalent uh, in public inquiry speak of cross-examination under the Rule 10 procedure if permitted to do so by the chair. Now what is the Rule 10 procedure? Well normally in a public inquiry only counsel to the investigation or a, a panel member may ask questions of a witness. Um, but a core participant, through their legal representatives, on usually a pro forma sheet, can apply to ask questions through their own lawyer or, as often is the case, through counsel to the invest investigation by um, setting out what the issue is that they want to ask about, what the question is, um, whether it's a new issue, uh, if not, whether it should be permitted. Um, that's an important um, part of the uh, participation process because very often a core participant has a specific issue and is uh, particularly keen um, to raise that issue. So the Rule 10 process enables um, that to be done. Um, it is um, um, subject to, uh, and, and, and also um, a core participant has access to evidence and disclosure that relates to their interest in the inquiry. Uh, there is often a restriction of confidentiality undertaking um, in relation to viewing disclosure. And the core participant uh, is entitled to see any um, draft report relating to their interest in the inquiry uh, before the uh, inquiry report is published. Um, how many uh, core participants are there in public inquiries? Well, the infected blood inquiry over 1600, Grenfell over 500, um, ICSA, uh, 350. The Brookhouse Inquiry, Alex tells me there are about 20. Um, the Post Office Horizon IT Inquiry, um, it, that's only just been put on a statutory basis. The applications haven't been determined yet, but I would anticipate that it's going to be over a thousand. As far as the COVID-19 the COVID inquiry, it's very, very difficult to say. It's a huge, wide-ranging issue. It's, it's uh, taken up two years of pretty much everyone's lives. Um, I would anticipate it's going to be the biggest um, by a long way in relation to the amounts of core participants that are going to be involved. Um, who are going to be the likely category of core participants? Well, in my view, um, because of this is such a wide-ranging inquiry, uh, it's likely to have a greater variety of core participants than any other public inquiry. So I've prepared a sort of, a sort of list. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list. There could be many more or there could be a lot fewer. But I think the bereaved families, the, the essentially you know, the, the, the cohort of victims are, are, are likely to be at the forefront here. Also those who are continuing to suffer, those who are suffering from long COVID, frontline workers, very important to those in the health services, transport, uh, the delivery post office services, priests, clerics, police, ambulance, fire service, workers, local authority essential services, refuse collectors had to carry on going, um, couldn't isolate, uh, those who are involved in food, supermarket and uh, mortuaries, those in um, uh, the detention system, uh, prison and detention centres um, are all um, likely to be uh, categories of core participant, individual hospitals, care homes, uh, an enormous um, impact um, that, that, um, that COVID visited on, on, on care homes, uh, patients and families, members of staff, those subject to do not resuscitate orders, uh, a, a very um, uh, um, you know, a, a, a matter of much concern. Uh, the businesses that, that, um, that, that didn't survive um, or, or were substantially affected, uh, rest, restaurants, the arts, travel industries, uh, sports organisations, educational establishments, and there will be a number of government departments, and I put down there the Government of Health and Social Care, Department of Education, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the Treasury, because, uh, and the Department of Transport, again, obviously, um, also important. Um, National Health Service Trust, NHS England, as Ben uh, mentioned, there will be various professional bodies and interest groups. Also, the um, scientific aspect, the academics, the virologists, epidemiologists, scientific advisors. Um, it's been said that, um, that the statistics and the data were incredibly important. Um, how did the government know whether the data was correct? Was the data correct? That's going to be an, a, a big part. PPE providers, test and trace, domestic abuse victims also, um, again, 
um, are, are, are also people who are significantly affected by the pandemic. And also importantly, individuals who are likely to face criticism. And we've all been watching on television what's been going on in uh, Parliament. And there are particular individuals who are likely to face criticism and um, are, are, are likely, and it certainly happened in ICSA, when individuals realised they were going to be crit criticised, they made applications for corporate discipline status, which were um, granted. Um, um, how are applications for uh, core participants um, actually made? How do you apply to become one? Um, usually by email or by post. The inquiry usually gives a timetable uh, that's posted on the inquiry website. Uh, that might be staggered because there may be um, a series of strands uh, in this um, process. If you are late in applying, you should uh, explain, but it's important to know that um, core participant status can be granted at any time. And I've been involved in hearings where uh, people apply for core participant status during an actual um, hearing itself so they could be properly represented. Um, what is the uh, legal test? It is rule five of the inquiry rules. And there are three key elements here. The uh, a person who is uh, going to be a core participant has to consent to being designated. You can't be made to be a participant against your will. And um, what the inquiry has to consider when exercising its discretion is um, whether the person played or may have played a significant, a direct and, and significant role in relation to the matters to which the inquiry relates, whether that person has a significant interest in an important aspect of the matters to which the inquiry um, is concerned with. So you've got to be um, involved in a direct and significant and important way. And also, if you are going to be, as I've indicated, subject uh, or likely to be um, subject to explicit or significant criticism, that is another way by which core participant status can be granted. Um, it's not an exhaustive test. Um, there are other reasons why core participant status can be granted that aren't um, included in the rules. Uh, chair has a wide discretion to designate, and it can be a, um, an individual or a corporate body. And as I've said, designation can take place at any time. Um, I've dealt with the deadlines and that there must be a consent to the designation. A chair can invite individuals to become core participants, but has no power to compel them to do so. It's also um, relevant that many core participants, this might not be the case so much in the COVID inquiry, may want to protect um, uh, and uh, their identities and uh, uh, be anonymous. Some government departments may decide um, that they don't have to be core participants if other government departments are. Um, that's an issue that arose in ICSA, but it may not apply in the COVID-19 inquiry. Um, what are the uh, reasons why an application for core participant status might be refused? Well, a chair might consider that a person is on the periphery, no significant and direct role. Um, a, a chair, uh, an inquiry may decide that, um, that, that an individual who wants to be a core participant or an organisation could uh, ins assist better just by being a witness and a rule nine statement um, could be issued. And it's very important when you're applying for core participant status for an, an individual or client uh, not to conflate the grant of core participant status with the role of a witness. Um, so um, how do you, um, if you are making an application for someone who wishes to become a core participant, how do you make sure um, that, um, you, that you're putting their best foot forward, so to speak, to um, overcome uh, potential uh, obstacles? We'll set out in detail um, the um, reasons why there's a significant in interest uh, in the inquiry or, or a particular investigation within it. Uh, involvement in an important way in the events which the inquiry is considering and um, if um, a, 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 an individual or organisation is able to assist the inquiry in any material way by providing disclosure or relevant documentation that's also a, a could be a relevant factor in the exercise of the discretion. Um, so um, institutional core participants, um, the test will all, almost all, always be met if it's a government department uh, which has policy responsibility in relation to an issue in which the, the uh, public concerns were raised and um, whether um, that institution or individual will have a bearing on the future 
direction of policy in issue. So it, it, yeah, a particular point in, in the COVID inquiry is going to be what guidance or protocols were there for pandemics in 2019 um, and um, what can be done in the future um, if another uh, pandemic issue arises. So policy going forward is, also, is always going to be important. So uh, it's important to make sure when applying for core participant status that you deal with matters to which an inquiry relates. And wh where you would normally go to those is looking at the scope of the inquiry, which is likely to be wide ranging in the COVID inquiry, and looking at the terms of reference. Um, that's really the uh, first uh, point of, of call. But um, in some cases, and I've given an example of the Ixa Westminster invest investigation, the chair invited or directed that any court participant who wished to do so could file submissions on the suggested scope of that particular investigation. And the chair subsequently issued a determination on the scope of that particular investigation. So court participants themselves can have an important role to play in what are the matters that the inquiry is going to be um, looking at. Um, and then this important point, um, subject to explicit or significant criticism and um, certainly many institutional wit witnesses, perhaps government departments, perhaps individual politicians or advisors, um, naming their names, but I'm sure we know who they are, um, are likely to be um, criticised because they have been criticised in the press already. Um, most institutions which receive requests for Rule 9 statements um, are, are, should, in my view, consider applying for court participant status, whistleblowers, um, also, um, and um, uh, representatives um, representing um, those that do have an interest in the matter that, to which the inquiry is going to be uh, invest investigating should also consider as a matter of course whether that individual is likely to be subject to criticism. Um, and of course you cease to be a core participant um, at a date specified it's specified by the chairman in, um, in a written form or at the end of the inquiry but a restriction order these are the confidentiality confidentiality undertakings most importantly continue to stay in force unless varied or revoked pursuant to section um, 20 of the inquiries act now i i don't have a great deal more to say but if we could just canter through the rest of the slides um designation of legal representatives um, a, a, um, that's um, uh, dealt with under um, Rule 6, uh, the Chair must designate a legal representative where a core participant has a legal representative. Moving on please, moving on again please, that's Rule 6. Rule 7 is important because that um, enables an inquiry chair to direct for joint representation um, of core participants. So that means that if you've got thousands of core participants, you can't have thousands of um, lawyers acting for them. I think that's something that happened in the Grenfell um, inquiry. So very often you have uh, groups or cohorts of core participants that are represented by a particular legal team. Um, and that's rule seven uh, for your information. Um, this is to do with applications for, applications for funding. I won't go into that in detail because of the time. Um, and because uh, Karine's also uh, dealt with this, but this is dealt with under section 40 and most inquiries have their cost protocol on legal representation at public expense. So there will be separate uh, protocols that, that, that accompany the uh, um, section 40 test. Uh, you can change your representative if you're a core participant um, just by writing a letter and um, then um, the new representative is going to be designated or will be. Um, disclosure of documents, core participants may be required to disclose doc documents. I think that's something that Ben and Green have dealt with, so I won't go into that. Um, I, uh, yes, Rule 10 applications, um, that sets out what the test is under Rule 10. And if we could move to the next one, please, and the next one after that. Um, and then practical steps um, in relation to Rule 10, which I've um, dealt with, but I've set out some further points there. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, um, and the next one after that, please. Um, this is section 40, and I think that's all there is from me. Um, there's a lot to consider in relation to participants. Just to conclude, I think there are really um, uh, four points I would like to make. There are the, the, the COVID inquiry is likely to have a greater variety of core participants than any other public inquiry. 
um, there is like there are likely to be more court participants in terms of actual numbers than any other public inquiry. There is likely to be a, a great use in I would have thought it, of Rule Seven directions for joint representation and legal teams, and it could be quite contentious if those who um, apply to become court pa court participants are refused, um, and that could be a, a, a significant preliminary issue before the inquiry gets under, before the inquiry actually starts. So that's everything for me. Um, I hope I haven't gone on for too long and thank you for listening. Hello everyone. Uh, my brief talk here will offer some preliminary thoughts on the potential scope of the inquiry and that will be encapsulated in what are known as the terms of reference. Terms of reference for a public inquiry are usually set at a ministerial level at the point of setting up an inquiry. Uh, a public inquiry usually is held under the Inquiries Act 2005, although there are non-statutory inquiries. Uh, and where it is held under the statutory framework, all the powers and provisions which the preceding speakers have expanded on will pertain. And it does appear the intention is to use the statutory framework for the forthcoming inquiry. Um, and so we can have a look at section one of the Inquiries Act, where uh, a minister may cause an inquiry to be held under the Act in relation to a case where it appears to him that particular events have caused or are capable of causing public concern, or there is public concern that particular events may have occurred. So that's obviously drafted in a very broad way to allow a minister to hold an inquiry on anything important. Sections four and five of the Inquiries Act then provide for the minister to appoint a chair of the inquiry and that before doing so, the minister must set the terms of reference. So the terms of the decision as to what the terms of reference are, what the inquiry is going to be about, is therefore an early decision taken before the setting up of the inquiry. Uh, and so it seems to me necessary if you are uh, already representing potential participants in the inquiry to seek to influence those terms of reference now or soon, not once the inquiry has already been set up, because then a regard attempt to alter the, the terms of reference is going to be extremely different, difficult. And so my talk is looking with a view to that, at what the potential uh, spheres of concern of the inquiry might be. So um, I've set out 10 headings. Um, don't cover everything that might be thought, but I thought they were probably some of the broad categories. Uh, deaths, care homes, detention environments, education, NHS, mitigating the pandemic, fiscal and social measures, government messaging, economic impacts and procurement decisions. And as with Karin, I've tried to uh, prepare a poll, which I'm now going to launch. And I'd like uh, everyone, if they wouldn't mind, to tick the three most important, you get three choices on this, uh, and we'll come back to that um, uh, later on in the talk and, and have a look at the results. So the scope of the inquiry, what it's going to cover is of course, largely a matter of choice for the government, but there are potentially some minimum legal requirements which the inquiry must cover. And that's because under the European Convention on Human Rights, where certain human rights appear to have been breached, there is then an investigative obligation. So I want to try and distinguish what some of those uh, matters that the state may be obliged to inquire into uh, might, might be. The investigative option, obligations we're concerned with primarily arise from Articles 2 and 3 of the Human Rights Act. And you'll see in our, in our poll, which is very swift, uh, that most people seem to think, 80% of people seem to think that deaths uh, on the poll um, are, are, should be a matter for the inquiry. And NHS resilience and preparedness, PPE, staff deaths, again, lessons for the future from, from that seems to be the top result. And then mitigating the pandemic, test, track and trace system, international arrivals and so on is the next less uh, interest people would say uh, in care homes, detention environments, education, uh, the fiscal and social measures that eat out to help out and so on, government messaging, economic impacts and procurement decisions. So there's actually quite a lot of consensus then on the three main topics 
um, the people are, uh, I think should be the subject of the, uh, of the inquiry. The one I think I'm going to challenge potentially in this course of this talk is, is the care homes issue and whether that should be a specific feature of the inquiry. So I'll start with the human rights obligations now. Uh, I've put out on the, uh, the slide the uh, Articles 2 and 3 obligations. Uh, Article 2 provides that everyone uh, has the right to life protected by law. No one shall be deprived of his life intentionally, saving the execution of a sentence of a court. Uh, and Article 3 provides no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Now, in the landmark case of Middleton in the House of Lords, Lord Bingham uh, set out the scope of the investigative obligation pursuant to Article 2, the right to life, in the case uh, on the facts of a, a suicide in custody. And he said this, the European Court of Human Rights has repeatedly interpreted Article 2 of the European Convention as imposing on member states substantive obligations not to take life without justification and also to establish a framework of laws, precautions, procedures and means of enforcement which will to the greatest extent reasonably practical protect life. And he carried on to say the European Court has also interpreted Article 2 as imposing on member states a procedural obligation to initiate an effective public investigation by an independent official body into any death occurring in circumstances in which it appears that one or other of the foregoing substantive obligations has been or may have been violated and it appears that agents of the state are or may be in some way implicated. So one sees that the uh, procedural obligation is uh, parasitic on or contingent on the uh, establishment of a finding of a breach of the um, uh, underlying obligation. Um, the next case, a case called Armin on the next slide, uh, Lord Bingham uh, went on to elaborate further as to the nature of the obligation, Armin, where he said the purposes of such an investigation are clear, to ensure that so far as possible the full facts are brought to light, that culpable and discreditable conduct is exposed and brought to public notice, and that suspicion of deliberate wrongdoing if unjustified is allayed. So, that's the first part, is to look at what happened in essence. And then looking forward, that dangerous practices and procedures are rectified and that those who have lost their relatives may at least have the satisfaction of knowing that lessons learned from this death may save the lives of others. The same approach has been said to, to pertain to Article 3, inhuman and degrading treatment. So in the case about Brookhouse abuse in the Brookhouse Immigration Detention Centre, Mrs Justice May held that the ECHR Article 3 imposes a negative duty on the state to prevent individuals from being subjected to inhumane and degrading treatment. And there is a corresponding positive obligation to investigate when the substantive prohibition has been breached. Uh, Mrs Justice May uh, went on to hold similarly applying Lord Bingham's uh, dicta in Armin and summarises those, and I've set those out on the slide, but I'll move on for the sake of time. So having specific regards then, what might in this context that mean for the public inquiry? Article two, deaths. The, the inquiry, it seems to me, if it is to be used as the mechanism for discharging the article two duties that arise, needs to ascertain what the true death toll might be, why it happened, how it happened, who is culpable, what could have been done to avoid those deaths and what lessons can be learned for the future. And it seems to me in relation to deaths of state employees, there's a particular investigative obligation. So in respect of doctors, nurses, administrative staff, particularly where shortcomings such as PPE shortages may be responsible. Then in relation to uh, Article 3, in human and degrading treatment, the aspects of the pandemic that may engage those obligations include uh, most obviously the treatment of care home residents, because as we know in the first incidents in March uh, last year, care home, people were moved out of hospital, infected people into care homes uh, and government policies which, which result in large numbers of infected people uh, being moved so as to pose a risk to others uh, is clearly something that may well engage uh, the definition of inhuman 
and degrading treatment to those who were then subjected to serious illness as a result of those governmental decisions. Uh, and it's well established that such actions so as to engage the scope of Article 3 don't need to be deliberate. Consider the Limbuela case, which is about the uh, homelessness of vulnerable people engaging Article 3. Uh, but then even after that initial um, catastrophe in relation to care homes, the reaction to it has similarly been uh, a matter which may well be the subject, I would say, of the inquiry. Uh, residents being denied contact with loved ones for lengthy periods of time and effectively held in detention throughout most of the pandemic in, in many cases. Now, one can see if, if one analogizes the blood inquiry, the infected blood inquiry that's in the news today, uh, in that case, a much smaller number of people were affected and infected by uh, poor decision making by the state. Um, and, and that justifies a, an inquiry just on its, on its own. Uh, it seems to me that the um, impacts on care home residents could well uh, be a factor. The, um, another important feature, as, as Lord Bingham in that quotation, outlined of an inquiry process is to bring to light the full facts, transparency. And we can see already the push for transparency. Uh, just last week, there was a decision of the Information Commissioner uh, directing that the Operation Cygnus documents should be brought into the public domain. Uh, and he made some interesting comments. Um, in respect of those, uh, which I've set out on the slide, in essence saying that uh, there is a significant public interest in understanding what the Operation Cygnus, uh, this was, that was pandemic um, uh, wargaming in effect, um, what the outcomes of those operations in 2016 were, and what was learned and what was implemented from them. So uh, that seems to be the sort of area which one could expect the inquiry also to be uh, looking into. Um, one thing to understand, however, in relation to these duties under Articles 2 and 3, is that there are other means of discharging the ECHR, the European Convention obligations. Uh, and I set out in the slide, in case of deaths, that can be through an inquest. Uh, in relation to Article 3 mistreatment, a civil claim, for example, may well bring to light the full facts and, and discharge the obligation prosecutions for crimes. Other forms of investigation include uh, the National Audit Office, which currently has a large number of investigations ongoing. The House of Lords has a select committee. The House of Commons uh, has at least 20 committees running separate targeted inquiries into aspects. And then, of course, judicial review. Um, for example, the case of Good Law Project against Secretary of State for Health and Social Care established a breach of the procurement regulations and policy, uh, and that in itself may be sufficient for those components of uh, what might otherwise be covered in the inquiry. So looking back then just quickly at that poll that we did earlier on, it does seem to me I, I pretty much agree with what where the vote went, deaths, NHS and mitigating the pandemic, probably the top three, but I would say the care homes and potentially the detention environments come within the Article 3 investigative obligation. And while it may not be essential to include them in this public inquiry, they do require some form of investigation uh, and it would seem the sensible form for that. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, concludes my section and we'll now answer as many questions as we can in the open section of this debate. Welcome back, Fiona. Hello, thank you all very much for what I hope was a, a very enjoyable discussion. We now, um, now is the answer for the questions. We have answered a number of questions uh, which have been posed during the course of um, this, uh, I nearly said hearing there, it's not a hearing, during the course of this talk. If anybody has any other questions, please do write in the Q&A box now. If not, what I think would be quite helpful is to talk about some of the issues that they've raised. So somebody asked a question about um, the devolved governments and whether or not there's likely to be a UK wide inquiry 
or four separate inquiries. Now, in my answer, I said, I understand there are discussions ongoing with the devolved governments, but I suspect there may well need to be separate public inquiries, particularly around the health response, because health is completely devolved in Northern I to Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. I don't know whether, so I think what you might have is a bit of a hybrid whereby some elements of an inquiry are held separately, but some might be held together for those matters which are sort of UK wide. For example, potentially in terms of resilience or potentially in terms of overall um, sort of public planning decision-making, Kareem. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, I think the thing I said in my response was you've got to remember that some devolved administrations will feel that they had a rather better response than others. So they won't want to be criticised or tarred with the same brush. And certainly, um, equally, devolved administrations might well say, well, there are parts of the inquiry that needs to be just held as one um, one inquiry because they will feel that they didn't actually have any decision making power in respect to those issues. So, you know, for example, they couldn't make decisions on international travel and, and so on. So I, I, I think watch this space. It'll be really interesting to see exactly what ends up being one centralised inquiry and what needs to be um, dealt with by the individual devolved administrations. OK. Um Somebody's just asked a question saying, could you comment on the legal status and exposure of those responsible for the gathering of evidence to be given at the inquiry in light of the decision of the judge who acquitted the defendants recently at the alleged cover-up of the Hillsborough tragedy? Now, I think, I'm, I think you, some of you may have read about this, some of you may not. That was about the fact that shortly after the Hillsborough inquiry, there was um, a set of documents that were prepared by the police for the, I think it was called the Taylor Review, which was the first internal inquiry, the first public inquiry, shall we say, about Hillsborough. It turned out that those witness statements were massaged, shall we say, I think would be the charitable way of describing them in order, um, so after the police officers had given them, solicitors went through them and basically said, don't say that, don't say that, let's say this, let's say that. That all eventually came out uh, and was the subject of much criticism. But when there was a prosecution for sort of misconduct in public office in effect by the solicitors, that um, recently resulted in an acquittal. I mean, my view is, is you shouldn't be, my experience is, is that the best evidence and the most compelling evidence is given by those who demonstrate the greatest degree of honesty. And there's no point trying to massage it because we will, people will find out I mean, in ICSA, when people tried to sort of massage things, we found out about it and we were able to say, don't do this, don't do that, because we've got the underlying documents. So unless you're talking about actually withholding documents and withholding information, it, it is pretty difficult to escape the lure of honesty. I also think you come out of it better if you if you confess and say, yes, we messed this up. And these are the reasons that we mess this up rather than continuing to maintain a line which internally you know isn't right because ultimately somebody will blow the whistle on that in this sort of inquiry so you're not going to get away with it does anybody else want to say anything kareen alex I, I was simply going to say that um it undoubtedly puts real pressure on those advising witnesses to you know to, to persuade them to, to tell the truth and be completely honest I mean I I think as long as if you're representing someone who's giving evidence as long as you have it, it, it told them about the duties of disclosure you've impressed on them how important it is that they tell the truth I think you're not going to face any personal criticism but I, I agree I think if I was representing someone who was likely to be criticised, for example, I think it would put a huge amount of pressure on me to ensure that they knew exactly what they had to say and in the most honest way possible. And I can only reiterate what Fiona's just said. I think all honesty, always the best policy, always. Um, and, in, and you know, you're being, you're going to be live on TV, you know, and there's someone, someone is bound to say, ah, but I, I know that what's being said there is not true. And then an email comes into the inquiry the next day and it's all gone pear-shaped. So that well, would be my fact, advice. In fact, we had that experience as somebody so did we. evidence live, somebody emailed in and said, actually, that's not right. Here's yep. a copy of the email that we got 10 years ago from them. So we were able, in fact, in the middle of them giving their evidence. Um, 
it's also um, I, it's also something that, that that the panel will pick up on if if, yeah. if if there is an indication that somebody isn't being completely frank and honest when giving their evidence there will be follow-up questions the panel members are very good at sort of spotting that sort of that sort of issue um, somebody's asked, is the answer the same in terms of honesty, where the local evidence may be critical of national decisions? Um, so in other words, this I think is likely to be to do with in particular the NHS, uh, where local teams may well have been saying, well, actually, we think we should have closed the care homes or we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have been discharging people from care homes. But we were told nationally by the NHS that that's what you've got to do. Well, that's exactly what a public inquiry is about. It's about everybody saying, actually, we were, we were, this is what we were thinking about at the time. And sometimes that will be the same and sometimes that will be different. That's what a public inquiry is meant to do, is find out what everybody was actually saying rather than what they told you that they were saying at the time in question. Fiona, there's also been a question about time scales, yeah. um, which I'm happy to answer. I mean, you, you, the answer is you, you didn't miss us trying to give you any kind of time scale for the inquiry. The truth is that um, what often takes the longest is preparation, just because you've got to send out all your requests for evidence, you've got to collate everything, you've got to set up the whole inquiry. Um, but I think much will depend on exactly what is said at the outset about A, the terms of reference, and B, how the inquiry is to be conducted. So if the terms of reference are really wide, then the inquiry will go on forever. If the terms of reference are rather narrower, then it will be shorter. Equally, it will all depend on whether um, they, for example, decide that they're going to have several parts of the inquiry running at the same time. So it's entirely possible that they might appoint different chairmen to deal with different aspects. And those inquiries might be sitting at the same time. Now, logistically, that can be very difficult, but it's possible. And therefore, you know, you might wrap it up. And it also the third element is it depends on the chairman you get. I mean, Brian Levison was absolutely adamant that we would wrap up the inquiry within 18 months. And we didn't. Um, so I think it just depends on all sorts of things. Does anyone have anything they want to add to that? Well, yeah. I think coming back to the devolution point that we were saying earlier, as far as I can see, the Scottish ministers, the Welsh ministers and any Northern Ireland minister have the power to set up an inquiry of their own. Um, and so you could well have duplication and overlap. And I'm not sure there's much that can be done to, to stop that because this has been, you know, it's, it's been a a field where devolved administrations have wanted to exert independence and I think that will continue. Um, so you yeah. may well have parallel inquiries in different parts of the UK as well. I mean what might be interesting especially Alex from your perspective with the immigration detention aspect of things is obviously immigration detention and immigration decisions are made nationally rather than locally. So for example I know that there's a, a kind of a sort of public inquiry or set of public hearings about to go on in Glasgow about what happened to refugees during the course of the pandemic, where I think the Scottish government is going to be critical of what the UK government's position was in respect of how immigrants were put in detention or not during the early stages of the pandemic. So you can already see the tensions coming out between the different governments in that respect. Mm. Okay, well, I think we've gone slightly over our time, but thank you all very much. If you've got any further questions or queries, please don't hesitate to get in contact with any of us. And we look forward to seeing you potentially in one shape or form once we know what a chair is and what the terms of reference might look like in order to try and give you further information. Thank you all very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>